Hello, good evening and welcome to our fifth Your Co-op Live event here live um, streaming from Worsted Park in Ipswich. Um, if you're joining us for the first time, welcome, thank you. Um, I'm Nikki Inslee and I'm part of the membership and community team here at the East of England Co-op. Before we move into the main um, topic of this evening, um, I wanted to take just a few moments to um, pause and reflect on the, the, the heartbreaking things that are going on in Ukraine at the moment um, and to update you a little bit on what we at the East of England Co-op are doing um, to support um, people in Ukraine. So we're working with other co-ops across the UK um, and contacting fellow cooperatives out in Ukraine and, um, and areas around the Ukraine to find out what support it is that they need so we can um, uh, offer support as this crisis continues. If you're looking for somewhere to donate directly, um, you may wish to consider donating to the DEC, the Disaster Emergency Committee's Ukrainian Humanitarian Appeal. So you can see the link um, for that up on the screens at the moment. And I think we'll share the website link later as well. But um, if you are looking to make a direct donation, that is where we would recommend that you do it. So, um, yes, thank you. Um, so moving on to um, the Your Cup Live topic for this evening. This is the second time we're dealing with this topic. It's a, it's a sensitive issue, but actually the response that we received from um, you all last time and the audience numbers that we've got again this time um, mean that it's obviously something that you guys at home want to know more about. So I'm delighted this evening to be joined by um, our expert panels. We've got Lisa Parrish, um, who is Director of Care at St Helen Helena's Hospice in Colchester. We've got Rachel Dawson Hi. again. Hello, Hi. Rachel, um, who's joined us again from uh, Daw um, uh, Ellison's and Mark Ling, um, a colleague of mine from the funeral services team. So we've got lots of people who know an awful lot about this topic um, sharing with us tonight. As with all our previous Your Cup Live events, um, this is an interactive event. So you get the opportunity, if you haven't asked questions already, um, please uh, use the question bars on the right hand side of your screen. Um, if you've seen a question that somebody else has already asked that you're interested in the answer to, give it a thumbs up and that will move it up the ranking. We're going to do our level best to get through as many questions as possible this evening. Um, and we'll also spend some time after the event um, looking at how we can um, respond to some of the questions we don't get to tonight as well. Um, for those of you that have joined us previously and have taken part in polls, we're only doing the one poll tonight and it's going to be the poll that we use to kick off um, uh, the conversations this evening. So you'll see that um, come up on screen any minute now um, and it's a, um, if you pick the answer, so it's how comfortable do you feel discussing your end of life plans with your family? Now, some of you who joined us last time may actually be feeling, oh, yes, wow. So the numbers that I'm seeing at the moment see that the majority of our audience at the moment are, are feeling sort of either very comfortable or comfortable um, with that. I, I, I hope it's actually some of the help that you got from us um, with the last event that we did. And hopefully we can build that confidence for some of the audience that are feeling um, less sure. Uh, right. Wonderful. Thank you. So the first um, the first part of this evening, we're going to talk with um, Lisa from St Helena's Hospice in mm -hmm. Colchester. What do you think of that result? Does that track with um, what you sort of experience in your day to day? Um, I'm slightly surprised at the, the level of uh, people feeling comfortable and confident to talk about uh, their end of life choices. Certainly, Whilst that you know there are individuals out there who who do feel very comfortable with that, certainly my experience and my own experience can be that often people feel quite comfortable talking about planning for their funeral and their will, etc., but might feel more reticent to bring up with their loved ones how they might want their care to look, um, mm -hmm. for example, in the future, where they might want to be cared cared for, what they might want that care to sort of be structured around. Um, so yeah, I find that encouraging but it's slightly surprising yeah well, that's good it's nice to be surprised yeah, in a good absolutely. way sometimes isn't it so do you want to tell us so you sort of talked a little bit there sort of touched on what you might do um in your day job can you sort of let the audience at home know a little bit more about what you do sure. every day i'm the director of care for st helena hospice uh, st helena hospice serves the population of northeast essex um, and we help that population uh, deal with incurable illness. Um, 
we have services much as you would expect. I think lots of people with hospices think about the building itself and our inpatient beds, and indeed we do have some inpatient beds at St Helena, um, based in Colchester, but the vast majority of the care that we deliver is delivered out in the community um, to patients and families in their own homes or in care homes, for example. And my role as Director of Care is to, I'm responsible for all of our patient-facing teams um, which are split predominantly into around three groups really, which is our, our hospice team caring for our inpatients, um, what we call our hospice in the home NDT or multidisciplinary team, caring for those patients in the community, um, and our compassionate community programme which encompasses our bereavement service which is for adults throughout North East Essex. Mm, wonderful. So you are obviously dealing with families and loved ones at, at incredibly difficult times you know just it, it must be um, mm. and very challenging for you in the team um with your experience and and the kind of um, and the work that you're doing what advice would you give about the plans that that people ought to be making we, you know you touched on being surprised mm. um um at the, the level of comfort that our audience has this evening but what would you advise to do things to make them less stressful when the worst happens I think the first thing is having a plan does make it less stressful. Mm -hmm. um, it helps with very practical issues, but it also helps patients and their families cope emotionally. Mm -hmm. So I would say the first thing is to start having some of those really open and honest conversations with your loved ones um, around a, a range of issues. And that will, you know, as I mentioned earlier, will include um, your you know, arrangements for your will, your funeral, your financial arrangements, it may be you've dependents that you need to think about, um, very you know, practical things around organ donation, etc., mm. um, our digital legacy. But then onto that very much more emotive and softer stuff around um, where you want your care to be delivered, who you might want to be involved in decisions about your care, should you, your condition deteriorate um, and you lose the ability to be able to make decisions for yourself. Mm. Um, and my advice would be to start having those conversations. And I think it is a series of conversations. It's not a one-off event in, yeah. in reality. It is a series of conversations building that sort of really open conversation with the people that are important to you. Um, and then, you know, making sure that they're really clear about your wishes and your choices and equally asking them for their views on that so that they feel that they're, they're part of that plan and then recording that plan. And of course, some of that will involve um, discussing that with your healthcare professional. That might be your GP, it may be your nurse in the hospice, it might be your district nurse. Having those conversations, having it recorded. Um, patients often have those um, records recorded in their own, own homes and held in a very obvious place so that people can access those records, have a look at what people have, have wanted, et cetera. So planning is, is key. Planning and is I, key. I think the, the advice of not making it one conversation is really, really important mm. as well, because I think that's probably the bit that makes people worry, isn't it? It's the, yeah. yeah, and I think people do feel very reticent about talking about end of life, and it is about you know, starting those conversations in a very open way. You know, do you think we should talk about that type of... Um, opener if you like yeah. and using prompts you know retirement planning is often a time where people might want to consider some of that but equally the death of a loved one or national yeah. events that may just be that trigger yeah. to start having those conversations wonderful thank you um do you want to sort of explain a little bit to the audience as well about some of the uh, advanced care options that are available so i think that's sort of the, the key to those discussions, really. Um, where do I want to be? And that needs to be an informed conversation around the challenges of, you know, if I, you choose to be at home. We know from sort of research that most people would want to be at home or want mm. to be in their usual place of residence. And for some people, that's sheltered accommodation or their care home. We know most people want to be um, in that in familiar, that environment, that familiar of, yeah. environment. But there are practical challenges with that. You know, where will the bed go? How will my mm -hmm. carers be able to access the bed, etc.? Can I still get to the bathroom? Those types of things. Mm -hmm. um, some people choose to, you know, they're, they're very clear that they want hospice care. Um, and 
certainly the teams that work for us very much lead those conversations, have those very facilitative conversations with individuals around what their choices are for around um, advanced care. But equally, you know, discussing things such as symptom control, their pain management control, how they would like that to be, to be managed um, is an, another consideration. And certainly those healthcare professionals can help you with those. There is an enormous amount to think about, isn't there? And it's, it's, it's not as simple as, as one thing, or the sorts of things you see on the telly no, as well, absolutely. isn't it? It's, it's not as simple as that. Right, should we go for some questions mm. from our audience at home? So we've got, um, we've got a few here. So um, there's one at the top here that's a, an anonymous question. So do you have to be referred to a hospice by your doctor or consultant, or can you contact your local hospice directly? Certainly for our hospice, St Helena, and I think most hospices, you can self-refer. So whilst I would say the vast majority of our referrals do come from healthcare professionals, um, certainly if there is an individual out there or family who think they would benefit from hospice care, find out where your local hospice is, give them a call. We, for example, have a 24-7 single point service, which is a rapid response service. Pick up the phone, talk to that service talk about your individual circumstances and you'll be given advice as regards what types of services you might be able to benefit from or you know where other um, services exist that could help you. Okay and I think sort of building on that there was another quest um, question that I think sort of leads on for that so how do I find out about hospice services available in my area? Again I think it's getting contact most people know who their local mm -hmm. hospice is you know they'll have seen some um, communications about them or, or whatever even you know fundraising communications so have a look look on their website if you're able to and give them a call um, and have that very kind of discussion in terms of you know what what services are offered where do you offer those services etc okay wonderful and do you have to I suppose this again is sort of related isn't it but do you have to live locally to the hospice um, in order to, to, to be admitted I mean, generally there is a catchment area for um, individual hospices, mm. but hospice care, I think, prides itself on being really individualised and working with individual situations, etc. So it may well be that, you know, your family happens to be in Suffolk or North East Essex, but you, you live, mm. I don't know, in Yorkshire or whatever. And if as part of that care planning, I want to be close to my family, I'd like to be in a, in a hospice locally, then again have that conversation with your hospice and and make that plan wonderful thank you and i think we just got um one more about respite care um so you know do you charge a fee for respite care um yeah. st helena at, at the moment we don't deliver respite care mm -hmm. routinely and um, what i would say is each hospice is set up slightly differently we all offer you know pretty much the same a level core, of care but yeah. certainly you know that core care but the nuances of that are slightly different mm. um, so again it's about having a conversation with your local hospice certainly if you're you know can talk to your healthcare professional if they identify or you identify that you're in need of respite mm. care they will absolutely help you access that That's what, and I suppose going to your point earlier as well isn't it it's about speak to the hospice yeah. speak to your local hospice and and to the experts um, wonderful um, uh, so we've got one here from Debbie. Do you work closely or separately from Macmillan nurses? Again, that depends a little bit on the local setup. Yeah. Uh, within North East Essex, we don't have Macmillan nurses, but we have community clinical nurse specialists who fulfil a very similar role. Um, in other areas, it may well be that they will have a Macmillan team who provide that community clinical nurse specialist traditional Macmillan nurse role I mean essentially that's about working with patients and their families to to plan their care to help them manage their care to help them manage their symptoms so they might be called something different but they're essentially doing the same role wonderful okay we've got one last question and then we um, will move on to our next um, our next panelist <laughs> uh, so is your end-of-life care just for cancer I'm really glad that question's come up, and Good. I think it's a really That's important so thank you, Jennifer. Um, really important question. Yeah. So well done, Jennifer. Um, no, no, absolutely not. One of the mm. things that hospices across the country are really keen to address is that hospice care isn't solely for cancer patients. Mm. And whilst that might have been where the sort of foundations of the hospice movement started, it is very much now for um, 
patients with all sorts of diagnosis. Mm -hmm. One of the things, one of the challenges I think the hospice movement has is that increasingly with our ageing population, people are not going to die from one thing. Mm -hmm. They're going to die, as a, a colleague of mine says, from a little bit of everything. <laughs> um, and really addressing you know, those individuals who become frail, etc. Mm -hmm. And one of our challenges is how we amend our services so that we are able to serve those those patients for the future that's really wonderful thank you so much i think there's some really great questions from you guys at home and marvelously answered so thank, thank you, you very much so now we are going to move oh, yeah. on to talking with rachel yeah. so rachel is joining us for our for the second time from yeah. ellison's yeah. to do a bit of myth busting yes um, this evening so should we start with the should we start with inheritance tax yeah no definitely that's a good one it's one that comes up all the time yes. So um, the very basic points about inheritance tax are that everybody has an allowance of £325,000 and um, if you leave an estate above that then it can be taxed at 40% everything over that. That said, if you're leaving everything to your spouse then that's exempt of inheritance tax. So um, obviously if you have a husband and wife and the husband would to pass away first, leaving everything to his wife, then at that point there wouldn't be any inheritance tax to pay. And you can transfer the unused allowance from husband because he hasn't used it because mm -hmm. he's left everything to his wife to the surviving spouse. Therefore, the surviving spouse would have £650,000 available before inheritance tax is payable. And if you've got a scenario where then that married couple are deciding to leave the family home to their children. You have something called the residence nil rate band, which can be applied to the estate, and that's £175,000 for each of them. And it can also be transferred over to the surviving spouse. So in essence, a married couple who are you know, leaving their home to their children, essentially have got a million pounds free of inheritance tax if, if the criteria is all met. There are, yeah. there are certain things that, you know, have, you know, conditions that have to be met, but generally that is the, the rule. So sort of yeah. planning ahead is... Yeah, which really is why important. it's quite important, isn't it, to, to sit down and have a look at, you know, the different ways in which you can save inheritance tax when you're doing various things within in your will. And even whether you're married or not, because yeah. sometimes, um, you know, if you've got people that aren't married, uh, hoping for those, bene you know, taxable benefits, that's not necessarily going to be the case. Well, it won't true, be the case. Is it true for civil partnerships as well? Yeah. Just as, so yeah. is, is marriage, yeah, absolutely, marriage yeah. and civil partnerships? Yeah. Okay, that's great. So I suppose, you know, that's, that's for after, after yeah. someone has passed away. But yeah. I suppose the other big topic, and to, and to build on um, what Lisa was saying, is around sort of care fee planning. Yes. And again, protecting those assets, isn't yeah. it? Um, yeah. So there's two sort of elements to that, really, because so for some people, they really feel quite strongly that they, you know, they've saved all their lives, they've paid tax during their life while they've, you know, been earning, and the idea that the house could be sold and all of the proceeds used to pay care is something that they really are not happy with. Um, the, the most common way in which um, I work with clients to, to sort of mitigate that is through wills mm -hmm. um, because you can, instead of, you know, husband just leaving everything to wife, what he could do instead is, you know, they own their house together. Um, instead of leaving his half of the house to her as an outright gift, he can give her a life interest in that house, which means she can benefit from it. Um, it's hers to enjoy for the rest of her life. But if she were assessed for care fees, she'd only actually own half of it. The other half is ring fenced and protected from care fees. So if that's something you do feel strongly about, that is an option. Um, but also the other side of the coin is some people think, well, I want to have as much money available as I possibly can to pay for the care. Um, and, yeah. you know, whatever level of care it is that I feel is necessary. So, again, that's a conversation for a family to have um, and just to decide what the, the objective is, really. OK, that's really helpful. Thank you. Yeah. And I think it's sort of so pertinent, isn't it? You've talked about our ageing population and um, yeah. care is, is, yeah. a, is a hot topic and, you know, challenging yeah. for everyone, isn't yeah. it? So. Yeah. Um, I think that's probably the next area yeah. that is yeah. probably of most interest to everyone yeah. is all about the sort of lasting power of attorney. And I yeah. suppose, again, comes back to some of the points that Lisa was making around yeah. um, knowing what you want to happen. Yeah, and because so obviously, um, mostly people are focused on the property and financial affairs lasting powers of attorney, which are 
really important, especially when we're thinking about planning for retirement and things like that. Um, but back to the health and, and welfare aspect of it, it is just as important um, because it gives you the chance to appoint up to four attorneys mm. to make decisions for you in the event that you're unable to about your care. Um, and I've had clients say that they've had, you know, they have a, a do not resuscitate document in place, therefore mm. they don't feel they need it. But I, again, I don't feel that that's true. I think the lasting power of attorney for health and welfare gives you the opportunity to have these conversations with your attorneys, um, you know, to make these decisions about what types of care you would like to receive and what scenarios, if you, if you did need life-sustaining treatment, again, what type of life-sustaining treatment you would consent to or refuse on your behalf. Um, and things even, you know, the level of, and pain relief, you know, do you agree to morphine or not? Um, they're the types of things that you, you know, decisions and chats you can be having with your attorney so that you know that what you want will happen mm. in the event that you can't make those decisions for yourself. Um, the lasting powers of attorney have to be registered to be used. So um, again, if people do do them themselves, sometimes they're signed and then they're sent to be registered once that person's lost capacity there's a very strict order of signing um, that the office of the public guardian accepts and if there's a problem with it at the point of registration is when those problems come to light and some of those remedies are to get the documents signed again but obviously if someone's lost their capacity it's too late for that so it's really quite important that you know if you where well, you either take advice from it and get it done by a professional or if you are doing it yourself that I would recommend that someone gets it registered straight away don't wait because it can take three months anyway and it only comes into effect when you lose capacity doesn't the it? the health and welfare would only come into effect when you lose capacity yeah. the property and financial affairs there is an option um, you can restrict it to only when someone's lost capacity or as soon as it's registered I now in practice I usually advise that you don't limit it to when some when you've only lost capacity because you can have fluctuating capacity um, which makes it incredibly difficult for your attorneys to use the document um, as we've seen in covid um, you know people have been in comas for mm. several months um, again it, it, can that be used or not and actually let's talk about because we are talking about retirement as well there might be a nice reason why you want someone to run your financial affairs for you. I think, again, I know I keep talking about COVID, but, you know, we've all been grounded for so long. Now that hopefully, you know, we're able to travel more freely, you might want to go away for a long period of time and, and let your attorneys run your financial affairs on your behalf whilst you're away. Yeah. Okay. And I suppose, uh, you know, sort of covering some of the stuff you were, were talking about there and, 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 and back to what Lisa was saying is especially with the health and yeah. the health and welfare um, uh, power of attorney, it isn't simple, is it? No. You know, the situations that people may find themselves in will yeah. not be simple. Yeah, and there is a section within the lasting power of attorney for health and welfare. You have two options. Mm. Um, option A is that you give your attorneys the authority to consent to or refuse life-sustaining treatment on your behalf. And again, like I said, have those conversations with your family about the various scenarios. But there is an option where you can say that the doctors need to liaise with your attorneys, take their decisions on board, but ultimately they will make the decisions. Mm -hmm. So just because you're making a health and welfare lasting power of attorney doesn't mean that you have to, because some people don't like the idea of putting that burden on their family to make mm -hmm. that decision. And they actually prefer that they're not in that moral yeah. dilemma of whether or not they need to make that call. Um, so I just think it really does give you control of yeah as much control as you're going to get if you're ever in that scenario and what we we do um with our matters in in our team is if someone's making a lasting power of attorney for health and welfare we will give them a letter of wishes and it will outline whether or not they wish to receive um you know life-sustaining treatment but then at the bottom it will state what's deemed as basic care you know, being fed orally, being kept warm, maintaining dignity. Um, and nine times out of 10, those that feel quite strongly about their family members being able to consent to or refuse life-sustaining treatment, take great comfort from that letter mm. of wishes because they know it's not binding, yeah. but they also like the fact that it's stored with the health and welfare lasting power of attorney and it's there for some guidance for them if, if they needed it. And can you lodge that letter after you've drafted your... 
Yeah, no, power of attorney. no, absolutely. Yeah, so I mean, we do it as part of the process, um, and sometimes, you know, nine times out of ten, the clients will sign that when they're, you know, signing the document. Mm -hmm. um, but if they want to think about it and hold on to it, then of course, there's no, there's no deadline Nothing for that. It. Okay, wonderful. So we've got a few questions coming in, unsurprisingly. Yeah. Um, so I think some of them we might have already covered. So a yeah. very popular question was around um, telling us about power of attorney. Hopefully um, yeah. the audience feels like we've, we've done a sort of pretty good job of that, I think, so yeah. far. So yeah. um, we are each leaving our half of our property to our adult children. Yeah. What happens if the house is sold as the survivor has to go into a care home? Okay. Yeah, yeah so I think what that question is asking me is if I think they're talking about a life interest trust which is what I mentioned about a yes. way to ring fence from yeah. care so if that were to happen and the survivor were to go into a care home like I mentioned mm. if the survivor only owns half of the property then their half that they physically own will form part of the care fee assessments yeah. the other half they're only entitled to the benefit of it they don't actually own it so it wouldn't form part of the care fee assessments um, when you do those types of wills, the executors also be usually become, well, it, nine times out of ten, the executors are the trustees. It's not someone different. Um, they'll be the trustees of those monies. So they would need to be held on trust for. So if they were to be invested, mm -hmm. then the survivor would be entitled to the income of that money, but they wouldn't be entitled to the capital. Okay. So you'd need to take advice on it, really. Yeah. I think that's probably the, the message. For yeah, I think so it is. Yeah. Get, some, get some proper advice whether you're talking to your local hospice or, yeah, or to yeah, a local yeah. solicitor. So, yeah. OK, so um, can I, where is this? Am I better to state a percentage of my will, or I assume a state really, yeah. um, to be given to each relative rather than a specific amount? OK, um, there isn't a specific right or wrong answer to that. All I can tell you is the differences. So if you were to give someone a specific amount, so let's say you wanted to give them £5,000, they would receive that £5,000 and that's pretty much it. If you were to leave someone a percentage of your estate, they're what's called a residuary beneficiary, which means that they um, have to be kept informed. Um, the executors have an obligation to maximise the estate on behalf of the residuary beneficiaries. So if there was a big decision like, you know, you know, can, can we take significantly less for a sale because the house isn't selling? Mm. It's been on the market six months, someone's um, offered £10,000 less, then the executors would need to include those residuary beneficiaries um, within those decisions, really. At least run it past them. Mm. Ultimately, it's the executor's choice, but you know, they do, should run them past. So it may be right for you, but it's more complicated. Yeah, I think that's the thing. I think if you, if you have lots of residuary beneficiaries and you're going to have to be including them in the decision-making process, um, you need to weigh up whether or not that's going to cause problems for the administration of your estate or not, or whether you'd prefer that actually £50,000 would suffice or, you know, whatever yeah. it is the, the, the okay. amount is. That's really helpful. Thank you. So, um... Uh, what should we got? So my mum is being is becoming more frail, but wants to stay at home. She is of sound mind. Can this decision be overridden? No, if, if someone's of sound mind, then they they make their decisions. Mm. Um, it's only in the event that someone you know can't make decisions for themselves. Mm. And actually, again, that comes back to the health and welfare lasting power of attorney. At that point, yes, um, you know, if your attorneys could make the decisions but not while someone else has got a sound mind. Okay, so we've got a question from Peter. Can I leave my home? I think we may have covered this, but um, can I leave my home to my daughter to avoid death duty, although she does live with me now and is aged 50? Right. I think that's a kind of that's a yeah. tricky one, isn't it? Yeah. Um, all I would say is if we just talk generally about mm. that question rather than specifically, of because course. if... Um, yeah. Peter was having a meeting with me. I'd have more questions to ask yeah. him before <laughs> being able to answer that. So if I just speak generally, um, a, a myth busting again, really. Yeah. Some people think that if you sign your house over to your children, let's say, um, then you don't own it at the date of your death. Therefore, you'll avoid inheritance tax. That would be deemed as um, a gift with reservation of benefit, because although you've signed it away to someone, you're still benefiting from that asset. Mm. Therefore, um, HMRC will still deem you as owning that asset and you still have to declare it 
when declaring the value of your estate. To and the does revenue. it also have an impact on the, the care plan or the, the care fee planning yeah, as well? Yeah, so for care fee planning, if you're doing it in your lifetime and your main purpose of giving your house away was to avoid care fees, um, the local authority can be, you know, they can take a view um, that you, it's called a deliberate deprivation of an asset and they can, if they really want to enforce it or look into it, they and, and if they're successful, then they can um, apply what's called the notional capital rules um, and, and that you still own that asset, regardless yeah. of the fact that it's it's not owned by you anymore. Um, so, yeah, it's not. And uh, but outside of those reasons, you're making yourself quite vulnerable if you um, are transferring your house into the names of your children. Um, there really has to be a good legitimate reason for doing it. But if there you know, if there isn't and you do it anyway, you just need to bear in mind that once that house is in your children's names, you know, if they became divorced, the, the house could form part of their divorce um, assessment, you know, financial assessments. If they were to be um, declared bankrupt, again, they own it. So you're really sort of making yourself quite vulnerable, mm. really. It's a lot to think about, and again, one to yeah. Get and, some... and I'm not. There are some. There are some situations where transferring your house um, to your children or to trustees or, or putting it into yeah. trust are actually beneficial, and there are reasons for it. But they're quite specific reasons, and I just and I know I keep saying take advice, but I think if you are seriously thinking about transferring your house out of your name, then you really do need to take it it's, it's likely to be it. most people's biggest asset isn't exactly. it so it, it is serious so yeah. it is it is worth drilling down so yeah. um what um at what point should i consider a power of attorney that's from anonymous yeah um so often i mention lasting powers of attorney to people and they say well it's fine we've got capacity at the moment mm. i'm all right at the moment and that is the time to do it because if you do wait until someone has fluctuating capacity, we can still do it in certain circumstances, but the steps are greater in that, you know, we have the golden rule to follow. We have to get doctor's capacity reports. Some GPs don't feel comfortable doing those capacity reports anymore. So there are scenarios where we'll have to contact a private um, geriatric psychologist, which is expensive. Um, mm. And if you do miss the boat entirely, then you're, you know, you're looking at a court of protection application, um, which is, you know, lengthy and expensive. So the sooner the better. I think, really. well, yes, the sooner the better. Yeah. Um, and going back to, obviously, COVID and people going into comas and things like that, you know, any age that can happen, can't it? So. Okay. Um, so this sort of two, I'm going to join two together here. So at what age should I consider creating a will? Yeah. And then what happens to my estate if I don't have a will? Yeah. Does it go to my parents if alive or my children? Yeah, OK. So starting with what age should I consider creating a will? Um, well, obviously over 18 to make a will. Um, I think really once you've got assets is at that point you should be thinking about making a will. Joint assets would pass by survivorship. So if you're you know, a couple that own a house together and you're comfortable with the fact that if what, something happened to one of you, um, that the house passes by survivorship to the surviving owner, you know, at, in that kind of situation, that's fine. But if you then think, well, I want to make sure that my own half goes to my family and not my partner's family, then you should be looking at making a will. Um, so there is no, it's not something that just people do later in life, any age for a will. If you don't make a will, then there's um, obviously the intestacy rules would apply. And there's an order in which um, assets pass to family members. And there's also the, sort of the statutory legacy if you're married, you know. So again, it's, it, it's something that you need to consider. And I think especially if you're a cohabiting couple, it's it's hugely important. Exactly, it? yeah. exactly. And in um, second marriages as well. Mm. And you've got your own children from your previous marriages. Um, you know, some people are happy and fine with just leaving everything to their spouse and trusting their surviving spouse to benefit the, the joint children, you know, the, their respective children equally. Um, but other times they, there's nothing stopping the survivor from changing their will and disinheriting the other children. So you, they're conversations for you to have as a couple and also with a professional because there will be scenarios that you haven't necessarily thought of or considered.
gosh. Okay, we're going to have one more, yeah. um, and then we'll then we will um, move on. But so yeah. we're going to. So this is from Stephen, and yeah. it might not be a short answer. <laughs> but the, um, once an individual has used up their savings on paying for care, yeah. how do you go about getting help from social services? Right. Okay. So it, that's usually the local authority that yeah. um, get involved with that. So uh, in practice, I think they um, contact uh, Suffolk County Council. About so your local, your local authority and it's adult social services. Yeah, to be honest, that's not it? something I generally get that involved with. So yeah. um, you'd probably <laughs> know more know about that than I, I would do. give the yeah. same, same yeah. advice, advice really yeah. to yeah. contact your local authority. Yeah. Wonderful. OK, right. Thank yeah, you ever okay. so much. That's really helpful, no Rachel. Problem. And hopefully everyone at home um, has found that a really um, useful um, sort of myth-busting yes. flash tool <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> around um, some of end-of-life planning. Right, we're now going to have um, watch a short film. Um, our um, a colleague Liv, who is part of our funeral services team, is going to talk to you a little bit about um, some of the work that our funeral colleagues get up to um, beyond caring for families. Hi, I'm Liv and I work for the East of England Co-op supporting our funeral services. I'm here to show you about how we as a funeral business support our local communities across the region. Funeral services play an integral part in their local communities and they support them through both local sponsorship of events and by providing in-person support at outreach events that we take part in and also host. And here are just some of the examples of the projects that we've supported over the past year. Some of our funeral colleagues have attended local litter picks as part of our In It's Bin It campaign to help clean up a number of our local areas. We supported the Suffolk Remembers event in Felixstowe to help bring people across the county together to remember their loved ones. We also hosted Daisy Day here at Worstead Park, another wonderful opportunity for people to come together and remember their loved ones. Some of our funeral colleagues have also visited our local food banks to help understand how we can better support them and they also hand delivered some of the donations that we've collected in store. And to round it all off, at the end of the year, as we led into Christmas, our funeral colleagues hand delivered a number of festive packs filled with food and activities to 125 local people who were either going to spend Christmas alone or just needed a festive pick me up. Now our team always works really hard to support the local community, whether that's by raising awareness for a fantastic cause or by getting involved themselves and supporting activities and projects in their local area. Well, thank you very much. That was Liv, um, part of our funeral services team. And it was a really good insight, I think, for you guys at home to, to hear a little bit more about what our colleagues in the funeral branches are getting up to when not helping families at most need. So we're now going to talk to somebody um, from our funeral services team. Um, so, Mark, <laughs> welcome and thank you thank for joining you. us this evening. It's really lovely to have you here. Um, can you tell us a little bit about because you've been with the you've been with us and you've been in the funeral business for an, an awfully yeah, long yes, time, yeah. haven't you? So, can you tell us a little bit about how you've seen the funerals change over the years? A, a, a long while ago, traditional was hearse um, families, all in black, mm -hmm. um, but now we see families wearing different colours, um, using milk floats, back of lorries, um, yeah, music. Um, Sort of sombre music, sort of upbeat music. So it has changed over the last few years, and it it does evolve. It, it all depends what that family would like and how the wishes of the family and the, the person who's passed away yeah. want to try their celebrating their life really. So it's kind of moving away from that sort of what you'd see as a sort of traditional, yeah. uh, you know, in my mind, that sort of Christian yeah. led by the vicar or the priest and, and very very serious. That. We still yeah. have families that are very sort of wear black. That's what they want exactly. But then we have the, the families that just like to wear different colours, different colour toys, yeah. um, telling families just to come in, no suits, no black, yeah. all different, different colours. So, yeah, it is evolving, definitely. Yeah. And so in those sorts of funerals, if, if you haven't got the, you know, that in, in, in sort of mind's eye of the traditional funeral that's led by the, um, by the, the, the priest, who, who else can actually lead these, these sort of celebration of life events? So you can have humours, you can have um, families... Do it, fat friends do it, you can have just reflective music, you can have people choirs. Um, it, it, it's, it's moved a lot on since a long time ago where you can, you can have what you want really. You know, you yeah. can have people, you can have a choir, a band, you can have, yeah, it's lots, lots to, to do. And 
it all depends, like you say, how that family yeah. and how that loved one wants to be remembered. And I know that we at the co-op, don't we, we use civil celebrants. We do. Yeah. Um, that, that, that have that kind of experience and yeah. um, knowledge yeah. of how to sort of run the run or direct the service. We do. And when families go to different family services or, mm. or see funeral celebrants, they'll always ask for them. You know, can yeah. we have so-and-so? Is so-and-so available? Mm. And again, that builds up relationship and, and that trust in that family and trust that celebrant will do a very good service yeah. for their family so important isn't it because that's i think Definitely. what people want is they want to feel like they've done yeah. building the right things and yeah. making sure that what done the right things done brilliant thank you so um the other thing because i've i've sort of talked about this that sort of traditional sort of christian um service do we support sort of sort of all faiths and none or yeah we do we do any faiths yeah. we've we do um seek funerals we've done one recently mm. it's it's what the family wants and if we don't know how what the hell that religion is we'll go find the answer we'll work closely with the family um we will seek funeral that the family would like to come probably dress mm -hmm. and wash their loved one and then they'll have the chapel to themselves for the whole day so yeah. the families can just come and go yeah. and we've done that recently actually um, mm -hmm. um it, yeah it's, it still depends how the religion is and we will work with that family to make sure that it is spot on and make sure they get the the funeral service that they want and they deserve yeah well that's really that and that's good to know i think that there is you know we can yeah. we can accommodate we have, we everyone have faith as well yeah um so we, we work closely with them as well yeah. so there's there is information out there as well wonderful um and um, if it, with your years of experience what what would you because we've been talking a lot about planning tonight haven't we and everyone yeah. sort of having that conversation what sort of advice would you give around sort of I would say planning. plan because we we have I've seen many times families <clears throat> disagree yeah. on how they want a funeral to go ahead. Mm. Some would want cremation, some would want a burial, some would want own clothes, some would want just a, a traditional funeral, some mm. would just want different things. So I would say plan from the very very start and and talk about it and yeah. get the you know the families together and ask them you know this this is what I want, this is what I would like, and make a plan. Yeah. Um, and make sure that the family know that because it is hard for us as well when a, you get two sides of the family come in and yeah. all of a sudden they're all different, doing different things. And people are upset already, yeah, aren't they? Yeah, their emotions are <laughs> high and then yeah. you know, they might want no limousines, they might want limousines, they might want a colourful coffin or they yeah. might want a picture coffin or a traditional coffin. Mm -hmm. There's lots of things to take into account and it is hard to try and get the, the wishes across that they yeah. want you to do. And it is, so if you're thinking about your own funeral, it's just making sure, isn't it, that that your family know what, what you, you want. want. Yeah, if you want a cremation, yeah. if you want a burial, yeah. if you want, if there's a certain um, place you want to go, crematorium, or if you want to go back into a, a grave with somebody else, it's, it's, it's just planning from a very, very start. Because yeah. then it, it also it helps the family to get over that and also helps the family to make sure that everything's okay. No one's, and that, there's no animosity then, is there? And yeah. No one's I was pulling together and sort of trying to pull apart. Yeah, wonderful. Okay, so let's go to some questions from our um, viewers at home. So we've got one here from Patricia. Um, are prepaid funeral plans really a good deal? I've read conflicting reports. Yes, they are a really good deal. Yeah, yeah they are. So with a funeral plan, you can go into your local branch, you can sit down with someone, you can explain what you want there are so many there's services there's a no service ceremony there's mm. uh, traditional service there's lots of things that you can have in there as well if you want music if you want limousines or if you just want a civil celebrant yeah and yeah that, they, they plan out from very very start to the very very finish and and i think from a financial point of view as well they, they can be yes. a sensible yes you so know, if you, if you yeah. plan out a few years ago and you paid that price yeah. the chances are you know it, You'll be a lot better off. Yeah. yeah. The price and they're all off. underwritten as well, I they think, are, is yes. the important they thing are, yeah. for people who are investing Definitely. whatever money. So, um, okay, so ooh, we've got another question here. Can a family member lead a funeral service? Definitely. So, if a family member, a friend, mm -hmm. anyone can lead it when the arrangements are made. Again, if, it's, if you want to make a plan of it, again, when you put it in your plan, I would like so and so to lead it. Um, if they want to read a poem, a reflective piece, or if they just want to sit there and listen to music for 40 minutes. You know, yeah. if they want certain pieces of music they like, 
Yeah, they can do, yeah. Okay, wonderful. Yep. Thank you. So we've got another question here is, if my loved one passed away and they paid for a cremation funeral plan and I wanted to change it... Oh, hang on, I've moved. I wanted to change it to a burial plan. Am I able to change this? It all depends what's in the plan. Yeah. Um, and if it's been signed. and So I would talk to the branch and see who the client is and the family are. And it, normally if someone set out a plan that they want cremation, we have to adhere to their wishes. So normally we would go that. You, you would you would work hard to we would follow do, the yeah. deceased. But again, we would yeah. talk to people and we wouldn't just go ahead and say no. Yeah. It's all about just communicating and yeah. just talking to our families yeah. and making sure that they're, they're okay and we do the very best for them. And I suppose it's that point of having that conversation before start. before yeah. the paperwork almost, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, to it is, understand yeah. where those differences Definitely. are. Definitely. Brilliant. Okay. So, um, so we've got one here about what are the prices for prepaid funeral plans from Donna. I think that's probably a director branch, isn't it? It is, yeah. So there's different, <laughs> there's different sort of funeral plan, yeah. plans. There's a, a, a director crematorium funeral plan. Mm -hmm. There's a reflective one. There's, and it all depends how you want to build it up yeah. and what you want to put in the plan. Yeah. So, yeah, so I would contact your local branch just yeah. to ask them. And they will send you information out as well. They'll yeah. send your brochures out. They'll send you all information out. And it's all on our website as well. Fantastic. OK, so um, website or speak to the branch, I think, is the best advice. We've got another one here is if I don't discuss my plans with my family, what will happen when I pass away in terms of my funeral? So with that, if you if someone passes away, the person that will always try and have a point of contact, a client who we go to. Now, this could be a, a friend, a family, um, a care home manager. It could be someone. So someone has to register the death. Mm -hmm. And then what we would do, we would take the point of instructions from them and then go from there but yeah it, it, it normally we would talk to someone we'll always have a contact name um, if there's a care home we'll have a contact name for the care manager and we'll just work with someone to make sure that they get their wishes yeah so someone who knows them well yeah ideally if, yeah, as, well, friends, as well as they can yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, so we've got another one here. We've got lots of questions tonight on this. Oh. So, um, um, I can't afford to pay for my funeral and I don't think my family will be able to either. What are my options? So there's several options. Mm -hmm. So, if that is, you can't unfortunately pay for someone's funeral, um, you can go to Environment and Health. They will do investigations to see if there's an estate. Um, if there's, there's charity pages as well to help up. Uh, there's a, the, the DWP. Mm. And also, you can always do a GoFundMe page as well. Yeah which we've seen quite a bit of in the mm -hmm. recent past, that you know we can get to a certain amount. So we will work with someone. Yeah. We won't just turn them away and say, no, you can't come with us. We will work with someone and help them and make sure it happens. Yeah, and a, and a, a, a sort of a passing that you yeah, can... Yeah, we will do. Be, we we wouldn't just leave them, someone yeah. and say, you can't have a funeral. We would, we yeah. would do our very best to work with that family or that individual and just say that we will... There are lines we can do. Yeah. Um, again, it's on an individual basis as well. Yeah. Circumstances of how they've passed away and who is in that family circle or the friend circle. Yeah. So, yeah, there's, there is lots so, of yeah. options. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay, so I think we've got one last question here. Um, how, so this is from Mark. How are service wishes exactly expressed and options discussed? So, with one of our services, we have um, coffins, we mm -hmm. have um, all the services. So, when the point of arrangement, We'll, we'll always sit down, we'll let, go to his local branch, have an arrangement room, make it feel relaxed, mm -hmm. and we'll just go through the, build, the funeral plan and build it as we go mm -hmm. along, the funeral arrangement, I should say. Um, so we always go with what the, the client would like. So mm -hmm. if, um, if, if Dad had his hair a certain way, we'd do it a certain way. Mm -hmm. um, if he had, had his beard sort of, sort of tied up, or, or we've had family members where, you know, someone's grown a moustache for the last 10 years and the wife didn't like it and she said, just shave it off. Just take it off. <laughs> so we've had that as well. Um, and the services with our limousines, if someone's asked for a limousine, we'll give them a limousine. It, it, we'll always, whatever services they've asked for, mm -hmm. we, will, we will deliver. And I suppose that comes back, that's true actually, isn't it? If For a, a prepaid funeral plan or if you're the family of, of, of the deceased or the, or the loved one of this deceased person and, and having that conversation. It, At the very start, yeah. yeah. It does help. And it, it helps us as well. Yeah. And it helps us uh, understand the family's needs as well. Mm -hmm. And understand, and it's, it, like I said, at the very start, it's just us doing our very, very best for the families and making sure that they get what they want. And that's what we're here for. Mm -hmm. You know, that is what we're here mm -hmm. for. Wonderful. 
That's really fantastic. Thank you ever so much, Mark. Um, well, we've had a we've had a very full <laughs> fifty minutes, um, uh, and we're coming to the end of the show now. Um, thank you um, to our guests this evening, um, Lisa Parrish um, from St Helena Hospice, Rachel Dawson from Ellison's, and Mark Ling from our very own funeral services here at the East of England Co-op. Thank you. Um, I've really enjoyed this evening, and I found it really, really informative and. Um, I've got some conversations to have, <laughs> <laughs> I think it's fair to say. Um, for everyone watching at home, um, information, so you'll see um, links, information and um, more answers to some of the questions that were raised um, this evening will be available on our website um, very, very shortly. That's coming up on screen at the moment, so eastofengland.coop forward slash live um, and everything that we've talked about tonight will be um, covered on the website there. What will also happen in the next few minutes is you're going to get an email from us. Um, returning viewers will be very familiar with these emails. Um, it's all about um, you telling us um, what you enjoyed about tonight, what you'd like to talk about in the future, um, and to give us some feedback so we can continue to make these um, interesting and topical for you, our members. Um, uh, everyone registering tonight, you'll also be really pleased to hear, will be as part of that getting a voucher. So you'll get a £2 off 10 voucher so you can pop to the co-op. Um, and buy something delicious and we're also going to do a prize draw so 50 lucky winners at home will also get a five pound voucher so another reason to pop to the co-op which is absolutely fantastic so um, before we go thank you thank you for you guys at home the questions that you put through were really really um, interesting um, and really really helped us um, get to some interesting topics this evening so thank you and thanks once again to our panelists have a good evening bye Dad said the first time he held me, he didn't want to let go, so he gave me Benny. If Dad wasn't with me, I could count on Benny. Dad struggled to let go at my wedding, but Benny was there. When they asked how I'd remember Dad, well, with Benny. We know how hard it is to let go, but you can trust us to take great care of them and of you. East of England Co-op Funeral Services. It means everything to us because it means everything to you.